All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us again for our next webinar, League One. Um, I'm looking, oh, there he is, Aaron, you're here now. Okay, perfect. I was gonna say I'm starting and hoping that uh, you show up. So um, so we're really happy to have a couple of our colleagues today, uh, Aaron and Oliver from the CPL um, Soccer Ops Department. Um, excited to be connecting more League One with CPL. I know Carmen, I, uh, Johnny, Dino, we're all very passionate about that and so um, we certainly are pushing for more of that. This is an opportunity for us to do that today um, and to also connect with uh, what we heard a couple weeks ago from both Joey and Dimitri. So I'll turn it over to Karim and we'll get going. Thanks again for joining everyone. Perfect. Thank you so much, Eva, for the introduction. Um, so as Eva mentioned, we do have uh, some very special guests today. So Ollie Gage, I was uh, asked him what he preferred to be called, Ollie. Uh, Ollie Gage and Aaron Nielsen. So Ollie is the head of recruitment and on-field analysis for the Canadian Premier League. And uh, Aaron is the coordinator of domestic scouting. And oh. as, um, as Eva alluded to, we are, this is somewhat of a three-part series uh, had begun back with uh, Joey Lombardi a few weeks now, uh, two weeks ago exactly. And he, he talked to us a little bit about the theory of performance versus development, what changes, uh, what components of the delivery of the programming um, are really important to get across. And we as a league feel it's a great time to sort of dive in and add some hopefully color and light and guidance to that. So then we of course had uh, Dimitri Rezvan come in and talk to us about the tool that is uh, MSA. And now we have uh, Oliver and, excuse me, Ollie and uh, Aaron to kind of put this all together for us and show us some practical usage um, of these platforms, of this knowledge and uh, how they use it in the CPL, which is fantastic insight. So uh, without further ado, Ollie, I will hand it over to you um, and I will shut off my, my, my uh, camera here. And if you guys have any questions, please populate the dialogue, the uh, chat box. And I will monitor that the whole time and make sure I ask it at an appropriate time. Uh, if you can mute your microphones, turn off your uh, cameras, that would be great. And we will begin. Thank you so much for being here. Okay, hi everyone. Um, wanted you to see my face for at least the first couple seconds. So you, uh, you know, I'm not wearing my pajamas at home and I'm taking this seriously. Uh, definitely feeling the pressure. I actually caught Joey's, uh, Joey's presentation after the fact. I watched it the other day. It was excellent. Uh, so hopefully I can live up to uh, his standards. I don't think my presentation is quite as pretty, but hopefully uh, the content is still okay. So I'm just going to share my screen uh, just now and begin. Uh, but as Calm said, um, anytime anyone's got any questions, please feel free to shoot them to Calm and Calm, um, you know, just call out as and when required. Uh, definitely would like this to be two-way dialogue, uh, a bit of give and take from everybody. If anyone's got any questions, it's important to ask them in the moment rather than afterwards. And um, I'm actually going to play a couple of videos. I know I asked you guys to watch one beforehand, which hopefully you all have. Um, so some of this stuff might make a bit more sense, but also I'm going to play a couple of videos. If it's too jumpy or the volume isn't working or anything like that, calm, please just let me know. And, uh, when we send this out after the fact, we'll make sure the videos are in there correctly. I will. So, I will do. Thanks, Ollie. That's perfect. I'll make sure. Okay. Uh, let's see. All right. Can everyone see the full screen? Yep, we can see it. Perfect. Okay, so just very briefly, uh, my background is in performance analysis. Uh, for anybody who doesn't know, I started off at Sheffield Wednesday in the English Championship. I came to America and worked for the University of Virginia as an analyst. And then I went to Human Di Houston Dynamo in Major League Soccer and now the Canadian Premier League. So I'm going to give a couple of insights into... Um, how exactly a performance analyst operates within a football club, how that can tie into team and player development, and also um, you know, what this means for you as League One or as coaches in Ontario and how this can be implemented using the MSA data. Uh, so before we begin going into specifics about the MSA stuff and data, I think it's important to answer the question, what is performance analysis and why do we use it? Um, 
So analysis, if we take the definition of analysis, is the detailed examination of anything complex in order to understand its nature. Uh, or another um, definition can be it's a separation of a whole into its components parts. parts. So some key features of this for me are the fact that it's very complex. You're breaking down its essential features into its component parts. So why do we analyze stuff post game? So why do I have a job? Why do we feel like it's important to analyze games of football? Well, first of all, we want more specific and better information to feed back to our players and our teams. We want to design better sessions so we can help them improve and definitely at the professional level, it might impact team, team selection. So some of the questions we might be asking ourselves were, did we play well? What exactly did we do well? What are our strengths and weaknesses as a team? And what do we need to improve? Now, obviously as coaches, we all have opinions on this and uh, we have a coach's eye, whatever you wanna call it, a gut feeling, we know our players, of course we do, but can we do more? So performance analysis is essentially exactly what we spoke about, analysis of the performance of your team or players. So it's now a specialist discipline involving systematic, systematic observations to enhance performance and improve their decision making. And in England now, you can do a full university degree in performance analysis. It's a legitimate uh, full-time field, just like sports psychology or strength and conditioning and at most clubs in England and across the world now, there's a whole host of specialist analysts working on team staffs. So why do we need it? Why is this a discipline? Uh, I ask myself this a lot. Why do I even have a job? I'm sure Carm asks that as well when she interacts with me in the office. Why, do, why does somebody decide that Oli Gage needs to be employed at their football club or in the league office? We know the eyewitness identifications are fallible. The other comes from an interesting aspect of human memory that's related to various brain functions, but I can sum up for the sake of brevity here in a simple line. The brain abhors a vacuum. Under the best of observation conditions, the absolute best, we only detect, encode, and store in our brains bits and pieces of the entire experience in front of us. And they're stored in different parts of the brain. So now when it's important for us to be able to recall what it was that we experienced, we have an incomplete, we have a partial store. And what happens? Below awareness, with no requirement for any kind of motivated processing, the brain fills in information that was not there, not originally stored, from inference, from speculation, from sources of information that came to you as the observer after the observation. But it happens without awareness such that you don't, aren't even cognizant of it occurring. It's called reconstructed memories. It happens to us in all the aspects of our life all the time. Okay, calm. Uh, did everyone hear that okay? Was that fine? Yeah. The audio was perfect. The video was a bit choppy, but the audio was very clear. Okay, so essentially that was a that was a expert in the field of memory giving a, tech, a TED talk about um, what happens to the human brain and how we remember incidents. And he's actually a, a criminologist and his specialty is eyewitness identification. So it's a phenomenon called the misinformation effect which essentially means when there's a gap in your memory, the brain is unable to process all the things going on in the world at any one time. And when there's a gap in your memory, instead of your brain acknowledging that there's a gap, it actually fills in the, the rest of the memory with um, guesses, essentially, or what, what it thinks might have happened. So if you take a game of soccer, um, take a really good chance that a striker missed. You know, you might remember aspects of that chance, you know, like what foot he kicked it with or whether it went over the bar or wide or, you know, whether the goalkeeper made a great save. But there's a whole host of information that your brain assumes happened that you don't know happened, but you think you know it happened. And if you take that times 4,000, which is the amount of events in soccer games, 
your brain accurately remembers not even 50% of what happened in a game of soccer. So they did a very famous study in 2009 on all the coaches in the Premier League. Essentially, after each game, about an hour after the game, and they all agreed to take part, they asked them 22 questions on mostly attacking things like goal scoring opportunities and shots and things like that. The Premier League coaches remembered 52% of accurate information. And they did the exact same study on some physical education students at university watching the same games on tape. Their, their memory was 41%. So the absolute elite world-class coaches in football, Alex Ferguson, Jose Mourinho, all those guys only remembered 52% of the information after a game accurately. So with this knowledge that only 52% of what they're remembering is accurate, why do we need to do analysis? Why do we need to do education? And one question I'll pose to you quickly is, are you happy designing sessions and giving feedback to your players and making decisions as a coach, knowing that there's pretty much a coin flip that the decision is correct or incorrect? I personally believe that if 50% of the things we are doing are incorrect or aren't quite accurate, we're doing a disservice to our teams and our players. So we need some education in this area. Just like if you don't know anything about strength and conditioning, but you're going to be trying to get a, fit, a team to be fit or strong, you would want some education, right? I don't think we'd be doing our players a very good service as coaches if, uh, if it was essentially guesswork. So very quickly, um, I'm not going to kind of poll the room, but I do live when I show this. Some people may have seen this picture before, some, have, some may not. This is a picture that was used in World War II, and it was used in England. And what they did was every time a plane came back from fighting over Europe, over the skies of France, uh, they marked where the bullet holes in the plane were. And what the theory was, was that they were going to put double strength armor everywhere that the planes get shot the most often, which sounded like a great plan, right? Map out where the bullet holes are in planes, this must be where the planes are getting shot. Let's put extra armor on these areas. But what they didn't realize that was that planes were actually getting shot all over, but the ones that were returning home were the ones that survived. So the ones that had bullet holes, as you see on the edge of the wings and in the middle, they were the planes that were surviving. So the areas where you see hardly any bullet holes, like halfway up the wing and towards the tail, they were still getting shot there, but these planes weren't returning home. So they actually chose to add a load of extra armor to all these planes based on inaccurate and incorrect information. So it's a little bit of an analogy, but as a coach, not only do you need to be measuring things with your team and reinforcing certain information, but if you don't know what you're meant to be measuring and you're feeding back the wrong information, you can actually be causing more damage than you're trying to solve by giving your players incorrect information. So I'm going to walk you through a very famous, in my world, very famous example from Liverpool. Uh, I'm, a, I'm not a particularly big Liverpool fan, so I always love telling this story. We're going to look at um, basically when Damien Camoli uh, took charge of Liverpool as the sporting director and made some pretty big signings in the transfer windows. And it was, a, to be honest with you, it was a huge failure in the end. So basically what, Damien Camoli did was he signed a big, strong, tall, athletic English forward in Andy Carroll. Um, essentially, he was a big, big target man looking for headers. He signed Stuart Downing, who ranked second in the league for crosses. He signed Jordan Henderson, who at the time ranked uh, played on the right-hand side of midfield and ranked ninth. And he signed Jose Enrique, a left-back who ranked seven in the Premier League. So essentially, the plan was... We're going to buy a load of players that cross the ball a lot, and we're going to buy the biggest, strongest, best header forward in the league. And this is how we're going to score our goals. So the plan was Henderson, Enrique, and Downing. Let's buy them. Let's get them to cross it, and let's get Andy Carroll to head the ball in the goal. But what Damien Camoli didn't realize or didn't investigate at the time was crossing the ball from wide areas and trying to score from headers was the least efficient way of scoring goals in football pretty much so essentially he spent an awful lot of money and a lot of effort in building a team to essentially do the worst thing you could possibly try and do to score goals 
So again, another analogy, but as a coach, not only do we want to be measuring certain aspects of soccer and measuring the game, but it's important to know that what we're measuring is the correct things. Because if we are, in this instance, for example, encouraging our players to cross the ball high in the air for a big forward, um, but that's the worst way possible to score goals, I don't think we're necessarily developing the best soccer players we can. So what does this mean for you and your team? We're going to take a look at the New York Red Bulls. I call them the MLS gold standard in youth development and team development. They are a team that has developed a lot of very good international and domestic players. You know, Tyler Adams is now playing in Germany. There's a few players there playing for their national team. How are they consistently developing players that are playing 50, 60, 90, 100 games for the New York Red Bulls in MLS year after year? when all the rest of the MLS academies are somewhat struggling to produce players. So how does a mid-table team salary budget wise manage to do this? First of all, they define a philosophy. And this is the Jesse Mars video that I asked everybody to watch. Um, hopefully you did manage to watch it and defining a philosophy is a major part of some of the education courses, which I believe some of you guys uh, have actually taken in the past. So that uh, I know Carmelina sent out um, some free access to some of them for you guys. New York Red Bulls, probably above anybody else in Major League Soccer, have got the most defined, like well uh, thought out playing philosophy throughout the whole club. So based on the video you saw, tactically, the whole team is on the same page. So every player understands their role. They can interchange positions. They communicate better. Jesse Marsh at the time had an unbelievable way of communicating this information to them. Recruitment at the club becomes much easier. Everybody knows what's expected in a certain position. So the recruitment department can instantly cut down the pool of players that they're trying to scout from. And when it comes to academy and player development, if the academy players can see what the senior players are doing, and they're being constantly reinforced and given feedback and given video examples of what Tyler Adams is doing for, in central midfield for the senior New York Red Bulls team. Then the player in the under 18s and under 16s and all the way down knows exactly what's expected of them in the same position. So in the example of uh, New York Red Bulls and Jesse Marsh, they're expected to pre press really high up the field and win the ball. They wanted quick play. So they would go central and combine whenever possible. And they wanted to create chances and score goals within 10 seconds of a turnover. These were the three kind of main concepts that New York Red Bulls were trying to implement throughout the club. So what can we do to reinforce that? How do we, how do we teach the players what quick play is? How do we teach them what turnovers in the opposition half are? We can measure this, right? Using the MSA data and using video, we can measure what these things mean and we can show video examples and we can start to say we did better at this this week than we did the last week and we're going to go into some specific examples so turnovers in the opposition half something that's very very measurable very definable and very easy right did you win the ball in the opposition's half yes or no how many times did we do it was it 10 was it 15 was it 20 if we're measuring this every single game and every single week straight away you've got some evidence there to provide to your players last week we turned the ball over 10 times in the first half but only six times in the second half what happened or in an average game we turned the ball over 18 times in the opposition half we lost last week we conceded three goals we got beat three nil we only turned the ball over 10 times what happened let's go find some video and look at our pressing the same with quick play the same within shooting within 10 seconds of a turnover. Through MSA, we have every single shot that your team takes. You have every single shot the opposition takes. You have every player touch, you have every pass, you have every cross, you have every touch on the ball recorded. So anything, almost anything in football that you can think of, there's a way to measure it. And if you measure it every single week, then you can start having objective things about how well you did something. So if we think back to the eyewitness video, when your brain is remembering 50% of information correctly, we might leave a game thinking, we didn't press very well today. Our pressing was terrible. 
what you might actually be remembering is two specific instances where you didn't press well, but for the rest of the game, we press really well. But if you then as a coach go and design a session based on it or tell a player that they didn't think they pressed well or whatever the feedback is, it could be incorrect. But in measuring these things, we've got another layer of confidence there and some evidence that the information that we're delivering to our players and to our teams is the correct information and it's objective. So there's no opinion. The guy coding the game for MSA doesn't have a vendetta against you or a certain player. What happened is what happened. So do the New York Red Bulls walk the walk? We talk about pressing high, we talk about quick play, and we talk about scoring within 10 seconds of a turnover. So their passing percentage in the opposition half was actually the lowest in the whole of MLS. So they're definitely not a possession-oriented team. And when you think about quick play, going central up the middle and direct, it's not surprising that they've got a pretty low passing percentage. These are difficult, high-risk passes, but high-reward passes. The opponent passing percentage in the defensive third was the lowest in the whole league. Generally speaking, if you're being pressed really high by a team, your passing percentage is going to be lower than anybody else. The percentage of passing forwards was miles ahead of anybody else in MLS. Essentially, they played more forward passes than anybody else in the league. They won possession in the attacking third more than anybody else in the league. And their passing percentage, again, was lowest than anybody else, which given the quick play and the directness of their play is not all surprising. So when we look at all these things combined, what did they do? Did they play the way they say they play? Did they reinforce their playing philosophy actually out on the field? So did they walk the walk or did they talk the talk? So without the ball, they ranked first in every category you would use to, to measure pressing. And with the ball, they ranked either first or last in all of the categories that you would use to reinforce their playing philosophy. So as a player, after the game, if you're being fed back this information, did we play well? What did we do well? These are measurables. These are specific things that we can measure. Did we play well? Well, what does playing well mean for New York Red Bulls? Obviously, winning is something you want to do. But playing well often means pressing high just like we want to, or going direct up the middle just like we want to, or trying to create chances within 10 seconds of a turnover. We now can measure this and say, yes, I think we did play well, or no, I don't think we did play very well, or it was kind of an average performance for us. You know, usually we turn the ball over 15 times and, you know, this game it was 16, 17, whatever. So we played right on the money, really. What did we do well? You've got actual evidence about what you did well or not so well. What do we need to improve? Again, you can go back to the objective information that your playing philosophy says you want to do. So we want to score within 10 seconds of a turnover. Well, we didn't create any chances in this game within 10 seconds of a turnover. So when you're looking at session design as a coach or team selection, if there's an issue with a player, or the information you feed back to your players, whether it's in person or through a video session, or I'm going to show you an example, oh, an example in a minute of some actual data, some evidence that you might give to players. You've got actual evidence here to give to them. And you've got information that's driving the sort of video that you go and fetch for your players so for example at houston dynamo um we were very much a, a low block team that used to explode on the counter attack very quickly well we would have ways of measuring how well we thought we counter we counted teams so in certain instances when we didn't do that very well in games we would know that based on the data and then it's making your decisions for you to a certain extent for your video sessions and the information you're giving back to your players. So you can almost guarantee that the information you're feeding back is accurate. And, you know, this whole coach's eye and gut feeling, and I've been doing this for 20 years, so I know better than anybody. Alex Ferguson didn't, and Jose Mourinho didn't. So respectfully to everyone, I'll say it to any coach in the world, if you're using your eyes, you don't know what you're saying is accurate no chance but what we have now is a way of measuring this and having some confidence in our findings so as i said before consistently reinforcing this playing style with the players you can send them video it drives the discussion with the coaches it's using the data it drives team video sessions 
and you can encourage the positive behaviors and you can give them evidence behind this. So here's an example of something that I did at Houston, uh, the University of Virginia. It was a post game, uh, a post game report. For example, if we look in the defending section, the first one down, defensive actions per shot allowed inside the box, we would know essentially how many tackles and interceptions we made for every shot that we allowed the opponent. So in this game, it was 21.6, but Georgetown made 35.6 for every shot we, we allowed. So essentially what we're saying here is Georgetown were better at pressing in their own half and they, allowed, they stopped us getting shots better than we stopped them. Objective information that you can say to your players that is no longer just a, a coach shouting stuff from the sideline or on a Tuesday night saying, well, our game at the weekend was not very good and I know this because I know better than you guys. And I'm not saying that that's what you guys say, so please don't, don't feel like I am saying that. I've heard coaches in the past say it. I'm the expert. I'm paid to coach. I know what's best for the players. You undoubtedly do. You've got badges. You've got all this stuff. You've got years of experience. But the best managers in the world need help with this stuff. And they need some objective information to drive the messaging that they're giving to their players. Ollie? Yes. Just a quick question that came up from the forum. Um, I think it's an interesting one that I would love to get your opinion on. Um, and feel free to, this is more of a freestyle opinion, but what do you think about creating a League One men's and women's one philosophy, style, and game model in attacking and defending phases? So um, Charles Ivanov, um, Ivanov is looking to see if, you know, if the league uh, could possibly contribute to uh, something as appealing as the New York Red Bulls. So I'd love to hear your opinion, and uh, I could also weigh in on this. Yeah, uh, obviously, as um, my job is to support the playing philosophy, which, you know, uh, my job is to design ways to measure playing philosophies and reinforce that. My job right now isn't to define what that playing philosophy is or whether or not a whole league should have one. Purely from my point of view and my experiences in the past, um, let's just take the New York Red Bulls example and say everybody wants to the whole league adopts the New York Red Bulls system. Everyone in the league is going to press high. Uh, it sounds great, you know, like every player you're producing essentially could end up being the same player. But what happens if uh, your first game in college or your first game as a professional, you're playing against a team who sit in a low block? And in your, your last year in League One, or you've played League One for the last three years, and every single team in the whole league has pressed you high. And now for the first time in four years, you're playing a team that sits low on you. You've never played a game against a team that sits low. Um, I think you're in danger of developing a whole league full of clones, which if that fits into Canada's model of what they want every single player to be like, to fit in with the, the global philosophy, then there's an argument for that. But I think you're also in danger of making very inflexible players that aren't used to playing against different tactics and different systems. Right. Now, thank you for that, Ollie. I, I agree with you there. I also think there's, there's two other components that come to mind. Um, you know, as a League One license holder, we're uh, hopeful that the uh, youth system underneath is producing a style of play uh, that is unique or personal to that particular club or academy. So, you know, your top end would reflect a certain style of play and you would be working backwards, as Ollie has said, to deconstruct that and build players for certain profiles and styles of play and philosophies. So um, within League One, we all know that the seasons are short. Uh, they typically, you know, your, your team is not the same as it was the year prior. And a lot of this is predicated uh, to, <laughs> you know, having those players consistently and you may not have those luxuries. So in terms of the league sort of dictating that, you know, maybe we want to play like the Canadian soccer model that John's been presenting and now the women's will, um, probably not in our best interest based on the different profiles uh, that are coming through the league and the lack of consistency that we have to work with. Um, so yeah, that, that's just an opinion. Of course, I don't know if it would come from the league, likely the club uh, developing their own. So hopefully this helps you do that. Thanks. Yeah. Where I'm actually after, right after this team one, I'm going to go into an individual one, looking at a player that I worked with directly at Houston Dynamo. Um, and he's a perfect example of how this would potentially do him a disservice in that 
He's a very, very fast, athletic uh, winger who's incredible at going on the outside, like a very, very dangerous player, an MLS all-star, in fact. But if the league-wide playing model was that you want the wingers to drift inside and be technical and kind of create and slip through balls and stuff, this guy would be lost, like completely lost. But he's a, he's a $4 million Honduran international. Uh, but if at 15 or 16 or 17, this was the style of football he was being forced to play, um, he would have been in a lot of trouble and probably never made it as a pro. So uh, I think you run the risk of pigeonholing and not kind of developing solutions for the players you have. So, Brilliant. Yeah, um, thank you. Appreciate that, Ollie. Yeah, just talking more about some feedback. So here's an example of some of the individual stuff that Leicester City give to their players after games. So um, as you can see, lots of objective information about passing directions. And obviously you can't see the specifics of this, but just showing more the mentality that this is what Jamie Vardy's getting after a game to help with to help him. So players saying that or coaches saying that, you know, that's not for me and we don't need to do that and it's overcomplicating it, you know, like um this is what happens at the elite level of sport now. You know, there's analysts in every age group of the youth academy in the Premier League. Um all the CPL teams have got someone working in analysis. A lot of the USL teams, everyone in MLS. Analysis is here. It's it's as here as strength and conditioning is. So if we're not working towards educating ourselves or implementing this, then we're essentially ignoring something that professional clubs see as a core part of their coaching process. So um, it's almost like in the 90s and the early 2000s when a lot of people weren't really sure about psychology or fitness coaches. This is a little bit behind, but it's something that clubs are investing in hundreds of thousands and sometimes millions of dollars in improving these departments and investing in them. Here's an example of a consultancy client I worked with a couple of years ago. Um, this is a almost like a chart of core principles that they have up on the locker room wall. So essentially this is magnetic and they have red and green discs that would go in these squares. So every time they fulfilled one of their philosophies in a game, obviously it would be a green one and a red one when they didn't. And they would the players would self-own this and track their own philosophies and reinforce it with themselves. Uh, here's another one that I did for a consultancy client called uh, Gannon, a Division II school out of Erie, Pennsylvania. Similar concept, right? They have on the on the top is like outcomes, like should we have won the game? But on the bottom is their principles of play. How are we going to win a game? So they want quality attacking turnovers. They don't want to be played through. Uh, they want to avoid poor crossing and they want to avoid essentially like wasteful shots. And they have metrics built around these. And every game they would measure them and feedback to the players. Did we achieve what we wanted to achieve in this instance? And if we take this example one step further, these are on the left column here, you can see here's their principles of play. They want quality attacking turnovers. They don't want to be played through. They want to make uh, good crossing and good shot decisions. So I've highlighted here, if you can see the first, um, what was it, the first eight games of the season, if you look at the played through section, it goes 12, 9, 8, 6, 11, 14, 16, 17. And what you'll find here is as they got to the 11, 14, 16, 17, this is how many times in a game after watching the video, the coach had recorded that they got played through too easily. So if you're tracking this game after game after game, all of a sudden when you kind of hit 11 and 14 and 16 and 17 the game after, you know there's an issue here. You know, four games in a row, your team is getting played through too easily, in your opinion, and more often than your average. So maybe it's time to do a video session on this. Maybe it's time to speak with some players. Maybe it's time to do some work on the training pitch specifically on this aspect of the game. So you're driving your decision making on session design and feedback to your players based on some objective information that you've decided as a coach you want to reinforce to your team. So essentially what we're doing is we're ensuring that the decisions we make as coaches week in, week out, match what we think our playing philosophy as a club. I am the head coach of Gannon University. My teams do not get played through easily. I'm measuring this. And for the last four weeks, we've been played through too easily. I have proof of this. Now I'm going to go show it to the players. Now we're going to do a session on it. 
you've now took out all the ambiguity and all the guesswork and all the coaches gut feeling about whether or not I feel like this happened. Now you're saying, I know this happened because when you feel like something happens, what you're actually saying is 50% chance that I've got this right. There's a huge difference. And this is why analysis departments are becoming so big in the Premier League and MLS and Bundesliga and all, all these places, because you're going to spend 30 million pounds on a player or, you know, almost a billion pounds on a squad probably worth spending 50 grand on an employee who's going to make sure that you're training them the right way also just like a fitness coach or a psychologist or anything so this is how measuring these things on the team level can build into your playing philosophy your session design and everything that you do as a coach and through the msa relationship you now have access to this information on your teams every single game is recorded and coded and provided to you on this software you have this information you can build your own playing philosophy, build an output report like this. It takes literally 30 seconds after a game to export it into an Excel spreadsheet, for example, and just put it in something like this. Very, very simple. But it completely changes the way that we coach. Before I move on to what this might mean for an individual player, does anyone, is there any more questions, Carl? Um, so far, so far, so good. Uh, no real questions coming through. I think um, there's some curiosity. I have a couple private messages. Um, there's some curiosity around almost how to do it, like genuinely, you know, going from the MSA platform to uh, inputting it into an Excel sheet, almost the practicality of it. I think the theory is excellent. So we'll, we'll, maybe we'll get to that um, either today or I can implement that in the next workshop and webinar that we're going to have next week as it's specific to uh, part of the field and a scoring project. So um, th that's the okay. only other thing so far, Ali. Okay. Sounds good. Well, if you need any help with that, let me know. Obviously it's something I'm doing week in, week out also. So I, I have way doing it for people that can barely use a computer right up to professional data analysts. So it's fantastic. Okay. Well, we'll connect offline about that and you can keep going. Well done. Keep it up. Okay. So that's the team side of it. Essentially, what we wanted to do is reinforce what we preach as coaches. What is our playing philosophy? How do we measure it? Are we playing that way? Let's change our messaging based on that information. It's not too dissimilar with an individual player. So for each position, we have expectations about their role. What should they be doing? What do we want? I'm going to use an example of Albert Ellis, the guy I talked about earlier. What does a right midfielder in my team look like? What do we want them to do? So Albert Ellis at Houston Dynamo. This is a real story. This is a genuine story of my time at Houston Dynamo and working with this player. So in 2017, we bought him for $4 million um, from Monterey in Mexico. And in that season, he got four goals and four assists from open play. So essentially non-set pieces. In the 2018 season, the following season, he got three goals more and two more assists in slightly less minutes. So how do you add three goals and two assists to a player's game over the course of a season? So we're going to go all the way back to 2017. This is essentially a map of every single shot that Albert Ellis took in MLS. And we're going to focus on this shot right here. This goal he scored, so sorry, I should have explained, green dots are goals, red dots are non-goals, essentially. This goal he scores right here, I believe, caused him a major issue that actually hampered his game in the long term. So the video might not be great for this because I know it's a little patchy, but uh, just bear with me on it. This is the goal he scored that I think caused him an issue. Is it jumpy calm or is it okay? It's a little jumpy, but I think we'll get the, we'll totally get the picture of what you mean. No problem. Okay. So Albert scores a goal from the edge of the box and everyone's going crazy. Players, teammates are hugging him. We're going to play it one more time. You know, fans are going wild, but just take a look at where he shoots from and the goalkeeper's positioning and you decide if you think he should have scored this goal. Now, when you slow it down, which we can't do live, the ball goes under the goalkeeper's body at the near post on a shot from about 22 yards out on the corner of the box. 
every single goalkeeper coach in the world will tell you that that goalkeeper should have saved that ball. He's a professional goalkeeper earning 200 and something thousand dollars in Major League Soccer and the ball's gone under his body. It's a mistake. But the misinformation effect that we talked about earlier is filling in the gaps for Alba. So maybe in real time, he notices that the goalkeeper made a mistake, but obviously he doesn't care. He's just scored a goal. But as time goes on and as other influences come in, so we have the coaching staff, we have media interviews, we have fans on Twitter, we have teammates that are all congratulating Albert for what he did. Amazing. You scored a goal. It's obviously a very positive thing. So what happens? Albert starts to build this, this vision in his mind that when I get the ball here, I should be shooting. I just scored from there. I'm going to score goals if I shoot from this corner of the box. So if we look at that shot map again and just isolate this kind of area on the right corner of the box and just outside, Albert ends up taking about 25 of the shots this season, all from the similar area. So this goal he scored against Orlando was actually in May, so only six weeks into the MLS season. So for the remaining 20 weeks of the season, he's being reinforced the message. Every time you get the ball here, take a shot. I'm going to play another video. It might be a bit jumpy, but you'll get the idea. So, as you can see, Albert has developed the habit that every time he gets the ball kind of towards that corner of the box, he's going to smash the ball as hard as he can, right? Uh, I think there's even a couple of clips where he might even take a couple of steps backwards to get a better run up. But literally, he would get the ball on the edge of the box and smash it as hard as he can at the goalkeeper. This is a guy he paid $4 million for. as a club, club record transfer. You know, we need him to do a little bit more. So what do we do as coaches? What's our action plan? Discuss the issue with the player. Support it with video. Show him these videos. Training drills. You know, let's have him running at some mannequins in training and instead of shooting on the edge of the box, push the ball past them and try and score because he's a phenomenal 1v1 dribbler. Have him take ownership of himself. So one thing I do with a lot of strikers now is I... Um, I have them print out an A4 sheet of paper of a penalty box and I tell them to make their own shot map. So I tell them, use these stickers. We buy uh, some little round stickers from Walmart or wherever. It costs 50 cents. Every time you miss, put a red dot on the sheet. Every time you score, put a green dot on the sheet. They are essentially making their own one of these. So we show him some interesting videos. Again, this might be jumpy. This, this is the exact video that we showed him. What are your other options right now? Can you slip that ball to a teammate? Another example, 1v1. Run at him, go past him. These are the types of things you would do with an individual player driven by data, driven by this information to help improve his, his decision making. So when we talk about performance analysis being a specialist discipline and it's used in observations to improve performance, what we've done there is we've observed a problem in his game. We've developed an action plan to try and improve it. And then we go and implement that on the field. We, or we sit with him and we give him some feedback. We watch these videos with him and we discuss it. And then you go out on the training pitch and you do a drill. And here's the results. 
this is now the 2018 season. So the following year. It's not perfect. You know, it's not like every time he got the ball, he dribbled past three players and scored a goal. But he was trying to be different. He wasn't just smashing the ball from the edge of the box. Here he's drawn in four defenders and now he's passing it to a teammate. Again, defenders coming towards him. Instead of just looking to smash the ball as hard as he can, he's trying to pass. And he's not perfect. You know, he's not getting it right every single time. But right there, instead of shooting, he's dribbling exactly like we talked about. And look how much more dangerous it is. But they won't have the distraction of anything else happening. Three in a row at home after this in the league. At least down the right side. And it takes it. Ahí en eso es aunque, digo, no sé que le duele. Ningún jugador quiere salir. Hay otro, por cierto, del terreno de juego. Ya tiene Albert Ellis. Arranca los mureños, sigue con su velocidad. Allá va dentro del área. ¡Eddie! Cerdoro wins it, puts it back to Briand, and another turnover. And once again, Elise is there, goes up for a bomb. Manotas, look out to sustain it. East for Houston, they played the last two midweeks, won the Open Cup quarterfinals. That's a giveaway. Chance now for Albert Elise. All of trying to help, but Lee Scott's in the front wide open now for Kyoto. Giveaway. Johnson is dwindling too long on the ball. He's looking to find the pass, and he can't do that against these front two. Albert Elise. So apologies to Sam was on some of them. Uh, but as you can see, instead of just smashing the ball as hard as he can from the edge of the box, he was trying to pass the ball. He was taking players on. He was creating chances for teammates. And he, when he was shooting, he was shooting from closer to goal. So this is his shot map for the following season. And as you can see from this area now, he's still shooting sometimes from there. But when you compare them to each other, he's massively changed his habits as a player. He's no longer shooting almost anywhere from outside the box. And when he is shooting from inside the box, it's a little closer and it's a lot less often. And when you look at where goals come from, so we use an evidence-based approach to teach players about where goals are scored from. We use this central zone in front of the box. As you can see, way more shots close and centrally. Just to show some of these clips back to back of exactly how different his game was. This is 2017. And now 2018. This is my favorite because it's against TFC. So very kind of clear, almost black and white example of how if you have an expectation on the front end for a player, just like you do for a team, and you have a way of measuring what they are doing on the field, then you also have a way of measuring if they're doing it well or not so well and finding things to work on for them. So if you take the team profile for the New York Red Bulls, they want to press high, they want to go to goal quickly, they want to um, go central up the middle with quick play. These are measurable things. For a right winger in Houston Dynamo, we want them to take good shots on good areas. We want them to be dangerous dribbling 1v1. And we want them to be aggressive and run as much as possible 1v1. These are things that using data you can measure. So you want to take, we want our striker, to, uh, our winger to take good shots. Or well, here we have the zone we want them to shoot from. How many shots are coming from here? We can measure this. We want them to be aggressive 1v1. How many 1v1s do they attempt in a game? You have information on this now. So you build a playing profile, just like you build a team profile. You pick three core aspects of their game and you measure them and you reinforce them. You give them the information. You hit all your targets this game. The last three games, your shot locations have dropped off slightly. You know, you're, you're not dribbling 1v1 as much as you were this time last season. This is information you have on all your players. And there's no reason why this can't be a profile you build out with them and you reinforce them. And for coaches that don't have so much time, have the players own their own process. I, as a player, 
have decided with my coach that I'm going to take good shots, I'm going to be aggressive on the dribble, and I'm going to run at my man as much as possible, or my, my, my opposition player as much as possible. There you've got three things that they can measure. Give them the information and let them measure it. Let them track it for themselves. And then when their performances are dropping off, maybe they come to you and maybe they say, I've noticed that I'm not running at my man as often anymore. Like, can you help me coach? You know, can we go through some video together? What's happening? And now you've got players buying into their own development and owning their own careers. And that's when you've won the battle. And that's when you've got players buying into not just your philosophy, but buying into their own future. So we use evidence, like I talked about shot locations, right? We look at the best players in the world. Where do they score their goals from? When we talk about, we want our players to take good shots. Jamie Vardy takes shots from all over the place, really. But almost all his goals come from in this central zone. Romulo Lukaku, exactly the same. Sergio Aguero, going to probably end up being the all-time top scoring Premier League goal scorer. Almost all his shots come from inside this zone and only just a few on the outside. And a bang bang for Arsenal, the same. So we can use evidence from the best players in the world to start to figure out what our players should look like. Now, no one's saying if you start taking all your shots from inside this zone, some player in League One is going to end up being Sergio Aguero. But you can be League One's version of Sergio Aguero and make sure that the shots you're taking are good shots in the right areas and it can be measured and they can own their own development. So that's why we believe investing in MSA and investing in League One Ontario can help you guys as coaches to produce the best possible players you can. And in turn, you know, right now, we'll end up with better players in the Canadian Premier League. And as we move forward on the women's side, and hopefully we have a, a professional setup on that side, that will be the same on the women's side. No, uh, that's that's the end of my bit. Calm. Okay. Oh. I'm more than happy to go back and forward with questions and you know anecdotes and stories or whatever whatever you need. Yes. No. Thank you so much, uh, Ollie. A lot of valuable information, and uh, you know a lot of this is predicated on coaches taking the time to develop their philosophies, uh, not only individually but as a club. Um, and then finding those measurement points. Uh, one very interesting question we have here, and it, it might take an additional tutorial, uh, but it's basically the question is, how do we access this example on MSA? So essentially they're saying, how do we clip the location on the field to get the, the shots data? So how would you take that? It's more the practical stuff that's coming out now. So how do, how do coaches actually go about doing this or players who are in charge of their own destiny and, and empowered? Um. For that one, uh, it's a shame that we don't have Dimitri. Um, we'll get him back. <laughs> uh, it's Dimitri's platform. So um, yeah. I, what we, Aaron will go into this next. What we do with MSA is we mine the data. So essentially we take all of the global data and we build playing profiles. And then mm. we kind of, from the spreadsheet, pick the players. So I would have to go back into MSA and look specifically at how to hone in on one guy's shots. But yeah. Uh, I'm sure Dimitri will tell you that it's, it's there. It could be done. Okay, perfect. And uh, in fact, you know, next week with uh, myself, we'll have a, our guest presenter, uh, Ilya Orlov, which everyone uh, knows on this call. So Ilya and I will dive into a goal scoring project, uh, one that he's done for longitudinal data for, for League One, his League One team. And I will do one for the U20 women's national team that I put together, which uh, is very similar to what you just presented in terms of, and I can go through exactly how I created and uh, plotted, uh, found those findings. So you know what, we will get into that. So no worries at all. Um, and other than that, Ollie, thank you so much for that. If, if there's anyone who has any questions, again, feel free to open your mic uh, or we'll just take a minute pause. I'll get the next presentation ready with Aaron um, and we can, we can move on. So thank you so much, Ollie. No problem, Calm. just while we're on it, I know yeah. um, very easy for me to sit here and say like, just click on all the buttons and you'll find all this stuff on guys. Like I. I've been there, you know, I've worked with coaches. I've worked with division three college coaches that don't have any data and all they have is a video. This stuff can be done just off video. If you plan on the front end and you have a good framework of what you're trying to measure, very, very easy to just access the video and it takes 10 minutes after a game additional to fill in your playing philosophy and do this stuff. So from a playing point of view, say you don't have, uh, you can't find how to access access this uh, all the shots of a player on a map right 
you can definitely see every player's shots. How long does it take to go through 25, 30 shots in a League One season and literally draw them with a pen on a map? You know, I would say it takes 10 minutes, you know. And like I said, if we actually got Albert Ellis, you know, he, uh, he cost us four million bucks and I'm sat with him pre on a postseason with a bunch of stickers and a sheet of paper and he's putting them on the paper. And we had, the, I could have showed him these pictures and we did, but in having him actually own it himself and do it himself, it just gives him some reps and he kind of gets it and he buys into his own development. So a bare minimum, if you know, you can't find out how to do it or you're struggling Get the players to do it themselves. Challenge them. Do you want to spend 10 minutes, 10 minutes after a game getting better or do you want to go home and go on TikTok and do dances and stuff? You know? <laughs> it's a good question, actually. <laughs> You're right on that. And, and like I said, you know, there's no doubt that next week I'm hoping to answer a lot of the practical questions on you know, how with the, the, the literal practicality of the software and I use PowerPoint and how I do that. So we'll dive in next week. Um, but other than that, I think, uh, Aaron, if you're... Oh, ready to go. I can switch it up. And uh, I know all you have another commitment, so we don't want to hold you too long. So thank you so much for being here and sharing your, your knowledge and your experience with us. No problem. I'll be on for the next 15 minutes, but then I have to drop yeah. off. Thank <laughs> you for having me. I appreciate it. Okay, brilliant. Awesome. And any, if anybody has questions for Ollie offline or through me, what, no, no worries. We'll make sure that we, we get those answered for you. So what I'll do now is I'll share my screen. Aaron, if you're there, we will get you teed up. Everybody, Aaron, are you there? Let's see here. Aaron Nielsen, are you there? Maybe you're on mute. There you go. Hello? <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Aaron nailed it. <laughs> um, I will start with mine just to, because I heard the question for all in the last thing, and I probably use MSA. Um, within the uh, CB, CPL. Uh, so in MSA, it does provide shot charts uh, for players. And then every action is broken down. So as Ollie said, um, it, there's actually a visual component on MSA, but you can actually uh, collect the videos very easy in terms of shots and things like that. So, uh, so I will begin mine. Uh, my name is Aaron Nielsen. Um, I work as the coordinator uh, for domestic scouting for CPL. Um, I've been working in soccer or football for 25 years now. Um, so funny background where I was uh, in the early 90s, I was trying to work in professional sports. And as we all know, the 1994 World Cup came into place. Um, I was asked to provide information for television broadcasts, radio broadcasts, journalists regarding uh, background on certain players and stuff so they could do articles and things. And certainly what I noticed at that time was how soccer was um, recorded or how soccer was um, analyzed was a lot different than what I was accustomed to North American sports. Uh, so I worked, so when I saw that, I certainly saw an opportunity uh, within um, the soccer industry. And so I worked in the soccer industry for 25 years, uh, or since more than 25 years now. Um, that work itself accumulated into a site called Football Reference, which is footballref.com, uh, which is the fastest growing soccer site over the last year, um, and basically has a lot of the information which I recorded and was involved with in those past 25 years. Um, I had some opportunity. I was talking to TFC regarding a scouting job, but CPL came around. And so um, I took the opportunity for sure. Uh, next slide. So yeah, I am the CPL coordinator of domestic scouting. Uh, I work with CPL coaches and staff regarding domestic need, player needs. Uh, we maintain irrelevant information on potential domestic CPL players. Uh, I, we have a player database. Currently, that player database is sort of in development. We have an internal one, but the objective uh, long term is to have a sort of uh, shared database that we will be sharing with coaches from League One regarding players cr across uh, not only League One, but across Canada, um, so that they can add information and access that information as well. 
Uh, we provide scouting reports for players, uh, video uh, for players regarding for coaches and contact information. Uh, the objective for us is to build a player pool and allow Canadian soccer and Canadian Premier League to remain competitive. And of course, um, our main goal is towards the 2026 World Cup, because I think everybody knows how we uh, build up to that 2026 World Cup and how we perform that World Cup will have a major role on the growth of soccer as we continue. And we are also in um, building, well, certainly League One is, to the World Cup, Women's World Cup teams of 2023 and 2027. And we help players make the best decisions for their career uh, through information and also by giving advice to clubs regarding what's the best opportunity for players to uh, eventually play in the CPL. Uh, next. Uh, so we break down domestic scouting into four levels. The first level is current pros, including CPL players. So one of my jobs is to uh, watch every CPL game, um, identify what the players are doing within CPL and their value within CPL. Maybe the um, coach comes to me and says a certain player needs to be replaced or should they resign someone? So I look at that. Um, our level two is League One Ontario, as well as PLSQ and potentially League One BC. Um, so we, again, uh, we scout throughout League One Ontario. We record um, video um, and analyze every game in League One Ontario. And then we also do U Sport, the U Sport Draft, uh, which um, many of you are probably heard about. There's a lot of literature on that. It's, it's a great opportunity for players uh, to get an opportunity to play in CPL. And if you want, I can go more information on that. Uh, level three is youth players, currently U14 until graduation. Right now we call it U14 because um, that is when the elite soccer in Canada starts recording games and recording goals. Uh, we hope to expand upon that. Certainly MSA is looking to expand upon that uh, regarding players who are younger. Now we don't assume uh, under 14 player will be playing CPL, but the objective there is to help and assist and certainly what Ollie was saying regarding the performance analysis. So that player progresses and has an opportunity to play in League One and then I have an opportunity to play in CPL. And the level four is miscellaneous. Usually miscellaneous count for senior players, um, some college players who don't qualify for the youth sport might be under the miscellaneous. Um, since this past off season, I've had probably a request about 100 players regarding their position and trying to come to CPL. Um, I think the interesting thing is that primarily most of these players come from a miscellaneous category because a lot of these players are currently trying to play professional soccer, youth soccer outside of Canada, but have some Canadian connection to them. Um, so they're playing, for example, in the 6th, 7th Division in England or in a youth uh, league in Portugal. Um, we examine, we sort of take their information, look through their CV, look at their video, but I'll be honest with you, about 95% of them are suggested to them is to find a League One club. I think the reason for that, number one, is I think the players in League One have certainly um, proven and should be considered as CPL prospects. But then the other thing is, is leagues like the Eighth Division in England or Portugal's youth system, we, no one has information on those leagues. So to do the work that we do and to do the work that Ollie does, um, we need some evidence that these players are good. I will say, and this goes true with all uh, League One players, that if a player does play in League One and excels and we feel that he should be in CPL, uh, we will try to do our best to allow the player to progress his career. Next. So this is an example of a scouting player report that we provide uh, to the CPL staff and CPL coaches. Uh, this example is Darren Harris. So we, this was probably written probably uh, last October, last November. Um, at that time, Darren Harris was playing at Connecticut. Um, he eventually was drafted to the MLS draft and is currently playing in USL. I think I have a note there on there. Uh, so basically on the first page, it just shows his scouting info um, and his background information. The next page. Uh, shows his career as a youth soccer player and his player as a career. Uh, some detailed statistics, kind of what Ollie was bringing up, key statistics uh, that coaches look at um, in terms of the impact the player could potentially have, a shot map, 
uh, touch map, you know, with Ollie, we were seeing with the shot map, his MSA profile, because uh, Harris played in League One, so he would have an MSA profile, and then a video archive of all the video that we put together for the CPL coaches so that they could scout the player. Now, in this case, for Harris, we have 34, 34 minutes and 18 seconds of footage. That is not just game footage. That is purely his footage itself. And because Darren Harris is a winger, most of this footage that we have available for him is regarding his finishing, attacking, and pressing. Uh, next. So to collect that information to be able to do this, this is what we call our sort of scouting procedure. And I will emphasize this more on League One than on uh, for CPL or for other leagues and stuff like that. In terms of League One, we have multiple connections, CPL, CSB, who are attending games. Uh, some of this is done in official capacity. Uh, I know Antti Tatera, which many of you know, um, have seen at games, have spoken to, and stuff like that. We also have a lot of connections within League One Ontario who visit games, give us advice on players, so on and so forth. Um, certainly as CPL grows and soccer grows, um, there will be more of that in an official capacity, including clubs could have scouts themselves who they will send to games. Um, all League One games are scouted, filmed, and analyzed. Uh, filmed and analyzed through MSA. And then after each week of games, I go review each of the games. We have a sort of short list of players that we're looking at. And then sort of update our analysis for CPL coaches in terms of those players' performances. Um, again, with the MSA, MSA provides reports and videos on their own. Uh, but MSA is a valuable partner for us because of uh, the information that they're capable of collecting and sharing with us. And then the final thing, again, you know, um, as he's very much involved with this, is the showcase games and other events. Uh, a year ago, we did, um, so in the last year, we did three major events that included League One Ontario players. We did a League One uh, combine. We did a U20 showcase game between Quebec, BLSQ, and League One Ontario. And then over, uh, just after the Christmas period, we did another combine uh, showcase game, um, Atletico Ottawa, first time they were in Canada, but for all CPL coaches to see for their recruiting purposes for this coming up season. Uh, next. So what is the League One Ontario relationship between CPL er, and myself and League One? Uh, CPL is a supporter of League One, past and present. Um, I personally, even before I worked with CPL, um, was a fan of League One, did a lot of articles and stuff like that. Uh, Anthony Tatera used to work for League One. He has a close relationship with the league. Um, even James Easton, who came up with a lot of the structure uh, for the league, um, done it through knowing the success that League One had in the past and how League One could um, impact CPL going forward. Uh, we feel League One will be a major role in the future of Canadian player pool. Uh, we hope to have a good working relationship with all League One clubs. Um, and a large amount of time and effort so far, as examples I gave, have been spent on scouting League One. Uh, next. So, you know, I know less for me, but more for Molly today. I know there was a lot of information regarding technologies and tools um, in the game. Um, certainly my reputation in the games fits in that category as well. Although when I regard my number one asset in the game, I always say it's my awareness of the game. Um, which, you know, and this is kind of what I'm trying to say here is this is what I feel we can all um, offer is our awareness and these experiences we have. We've all had experiences where a player succeeded, a uh, player being uh, offered a pro uh, contract, a player uh, getting a scholarship to a university, a player getting called up to a national team. But we also have experience of where things didn't turn out as hoped. Uh, maybe a player goes to Europe and doesn't fulfill his career, uh, a player gets burnt out, or a player goes to college and doesn't have the best time. So collectively, I think it's important that we share these experiences and make smart decisions collectively. And overall, I think it will improve what we're doing um, and also improve uh, the overall, um, your process and what you're doing regarding your players. And finally, the, the objective of this is to grow the Canadian Premier League and the League One to the league we wish to have.
Thank you so much, Aaron, for that. Sorry, I just was playing around with the mic here. <laughs> uh, appreciate that so much. And again, uh, feel free. I have a question here in the, oh yeah. So it's just uh, basically a, a message for me specifically, no problem. So uh, Aaron, thank you so much for sharing that. It is really important to talk about how we can connect the dots. And um, I know you have a full list of players that you're tracking both on the men's and women's side. So if any particular clubs have that uh, curiosity around, you know, how you go about tracking players, who you're particularly tracking, uh, who they feel <laughs> should be tracking. Um, is it safe to say it's okay to contact you uh, privately offline uh, just to discuss and keep that line of communication open? Sure, certainly. Yeah, I know for a fact, and again, um, Anthony Tatero has been assisting with this, but we've had a chance, especially on the men's side, to speak uh, with most of the coaches already and discuss players. But yeah, I would say this is an open concept. Uh, through all time and as the season goes. And uh, we will be reaching out too in terms of information regarding players and trying to give the best information to our CPL coaches. That, that's brilliant. And uh, like you said, the more information we can share and transparency that's there, it helps everybody elevate the delivery of uh, the League One platform because we know it's such a pivotal part um, and going to continue to be in this pathway uh, progression for players. So again, Aaron, thank you so much for putting that together, for taking the time to speak. Oliver, I can see you're still on. So thank you for that. Ollie, I keep doing that. Um, and for everyone else, uh, if you have any curiosities around this topic, feel free to email me directly. And I will make sure that next week we answer some of these questions about uh, how to deliver the practicality of this analysis and performance analysis. So um, thanks again, everyone. We wish you the best day forward. I know everyone's uh, likely super busy, so we'll let you get on to your next thing. We hope you enjoyed it. Ollie, Aaron, truly thank you. And uh, we will speak to you all soon. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate Thanks. it. Have a good day. Thank you.